every one of us has personal beliefs. And whether or not our beliefs are generally positive or pessimistic in nature, all the same. Our beliefs directly impact how we live our lives, for better or for worse. Needless to say, beliefs play a pivotal role in the lives of people of faith or religious people. And speaking as a Christian, when I say that I believe in God, I'm saying that I've placed my faith in Him. But have you ever really thought of what it means to place your faith in someone or something? Faith is defined as complete trust or confidence in someone or something. So by saying that I've placed my faith in God, I'm saying that He has my complete trust and confidence. And I definitely like the way that sounds. And it's easy to say, God, my faith is in you. But if you think of it, how true is that statement? And how can I know for sure? The Bible is a book of faith, compiled of many books, written by many different people over the course of many, many years. And those who believe in the Bible, like myself, believe its collective contents to be the inspired Word of God. And there's a chapter in the Bible from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, and it's known by many as the Hall of Faith. And this is because that chapter really highlights the subject of faith. And it defines faith by saying, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. This reinforces that idea that your faith manifests itself into reality. What you believe affects your life. And for Christians or any people of any faith group, this has huge implications. This says that if you truly believe, you'll live like you do. But it also implies the opposite, saying that if you don't live like you believe, then you probably don't. Now, this raises a big question for all people of faith. But being a Christian, I'll just focus on Christians. So, if I'm a believer that says that I believe in the Bible and that God has my complete trust and confidence, Am I living like it? If not, then maybe I don't believe like I think I do. Maybe I don't have faith. And we're told in the Hall of Faith chapter, it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. Did you hear that? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So what kind of faith are we talking about here? Well, this is a faith that believes that God exists, a faith that seeks Him in this life. And by seeking Him, this implies a person who wants to know God, wants to follow Him, wants to obey Him. That's the kind of faith that pleases God, faith that He rewards. This is a faith of complete trust and confidence in God, a faith of obedience to Him and His Word. And Jesus said, if you love me, obey my commandments. So what does a life of complete trust and confidence in God, a life of loving obedience to Him and His Word, look like? Well, to me, this sounds like a life of someone who knows God, someone with an ongoing, active relationship with Him. And with this in mind, and in addition to this, we all know that we're not perfect, right? Only Jesus is perfect. So we won't always get this right, but I believe that this kind of faith also looks like someone who says yes to God, more often than they say no. So just as a personal test, evaluate yourself on that. Are you someone who says yes to God more often than you say no? Now for me, this raises a few questions. The first one, am I hearing from God? And this is a question that can often spark debate. Can you hear from God? Well, I believe you can. I believe God speaks to us through His written word, the Bible. I believe that God can speak to us through the counsel of trusted, godly friends. But what has made the biggest impact in my own life is my belief that God can speak to us directly, spirit to spirit. In order to say yes to God, then you need to hear Him, somehow. How can you be obedient to God if you're not hearing, or learning, or receiving direction from His Holy Spirit? If you're not hearing from God and you're just kind of living this life kind of aimlessly, following your own human wisdom and understanding, then your obedience may only be to yourself, no one else. And if you're not hearing from God, maybe you haven't drawn near enough to hear Him. Do you want to hear Him? Will you earnestly seek Him out? We seek God out by striving to spend time with Him. If we know that the Bible is the inspired Word of God and has the power to speak into our lives, 
then why don't we spend more time reading it? And if we know that God can speak directly to our spirits, then why don't we spend more time in prayer? These are disciplines that practically any Christian can improve on, and they're powerful weapons at our disposal in this life of spiritual warfare. But probably the most common default for any Christian wanting to hear from God is to go to another person for counsel. And though this is often an avenue that God uses to speak to people, I'd still advise caution with this. People, even the godliest, won't always get things right when it comes to giving godly advice. So before going to others for counsel, I'd always pray and turn to God first. And then if I've done that, then sought godly counsel, I'd weigh anything I hear against God's word and through prayer before acting on it. Now let's say I do all that, and assuming that I'm aware and believe that God has spoken into my life on different occasions, the next question I have to ask is, am I obedient? Am I someone who says yes to God more often than I say no? When I've heard God speak, when I know what He requires of me as I grow in the faith, and when I've felt or encountered an opportunity to exercise my faith, knowing that God is with me and that He's for me, did I do what I knew or believed was right? Most of us have no problem saying yes to God until the moment it might cost them something. Many of you will know what I'm talking about. The opportunity to be obedient can often come at a cost. You're putting yourself out there, stepping out of comfort zones, possibly into harm's way. And for what? To be obedient? God wouldn't put us into that position, would He? For our personal betterment? To grow us? To grow His kingdom? Yes, He would. Some might even say, it's what He does. And probably the biggest reason that chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is called the Hall of Faith is because it lists several heroes of the Christian faith who greatly pleased God because of their trust and confidence in Him. They truly had faith in God, and it was clearly evident in how they lived their lives. And though you may not remember the stories that made their names famous, you might remember their names. Noah, Joseph, Moses, Samson, David, and that's just to name a few. When you get to know these people and hear their stories, it's easy to see why they are heroes of the faith. They had real faith in God, and their complete trust and confidence in God and His Word told them that they were called to live more than just ordinary lives, and they believed it. This allowed them to live in such a way that it set them apart from the general population. Because of their faith, God called them beyond the limits of comfort, beyond the limits of safety, beyond the limits of conventional wisdom. And because of their obedience, they witnessed firsthand the mighty power of God manifested in and all around them. God moved on their behalf. He fought for them. He defended them. He provided for them. And He established them. What may seem crazy to some of us is that God actually wants to do the same for any one of us who places their faith in Him. Imagine that seeing your name listed in the Hall of Faith right next to Noah and Moses. Many Christians place our heroes of the faith on pedestals, believing them to be somehow more special or more chosen by God for a specific purpose than any one of us. Well, what if the truth is that they're not all that different from you and me? You too are chosen by God for a specific purpose, one equally special, one equally important in the eyes of God. The only difference may be our willingness to say yes to God like they did. And that's the catch. For that kind of faith, to see your name in the Hall of Faith right alongside your heroes, it means that you're going to have to live like they lived, believe like they believed, and let it move you like it moved them. And of course, if you know their stories, it also means that you will experience what they experienced. 
Their faith became as strong as it was because they exercised it. Time and time again, they put their money where their mouth was. And like many of us, they probably weren't always people of great faith. Maybe their faith started out very small. But what little faith they may have started with was exercised. They made a pattern in their lives of saying yes to God, even when the cost was small. And even as it grew, they said yes. And as they exercised their faith, their faith grew. But like many of us already know, that growth does not come without resistance. And this is where so many of us get tripped up. We do not like pain. We do not like discomfort. For many of us, our life's pursuit is to acquire as much safety and comfort as possible. So to willingly subject ourselves to resistance or pain or trials, just to grow our faith, this goes against our natural grain. But this is exactly what causes us to grow. Jesus' own brother James challenges us by saying, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now this is a great example of something that Christians say they believe, but evidence to support this belief may not be all that prominent in our lives. It is my default reaction to want to avoid trouble and discomfort. So to consider those things an opportunity for great joy and personal growth? This goes against conventional human wisdom, but that's exactly where faith lives beyond conventional human wisdom. The heroes of the faith believed that God was calling them to more than ordinary, and they believed, and they lived the extraordinary. They knew that they had to leave the comfort zone to exercise faith, and they knew that without faith they couldn't please God. And like them, God is calling us to live lives of faith. Will we be obedient? Remember, the only difference between them and us may be our level of obedience. The last question this raises for me is, am I ready? Am I ready to take that next step of obedience, whatever that means? Am I ready to go deeper, to draw nearer to God, and to exercise and grow my faith? And these exercises in faith may start out small, like choosing to say yes to God by trying to be more truthful, generous, and kind abstaining from gossip or the wrong kind of music or movies, choosing to spend more time connecting with God by reading His Word and praying. And when it seems you get a good handle on all this, the resistance increases to grow your faith. But you must first show that you are faithful in the small things. And Jesus reminds us of this multiple times. He says, if you are faithful in little things, you will be faithful in large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. God entrusts greater responsibility to those who prove themselves faithful with what they have. And where this gets interesting is that God presents us with ever-increasing opportunities to be faithful. At least in my experience, I've found this to be true. So long as I'm faithful, the opportunities will continue to increase and challenge my own wisdom and understanding, my willingness to step out of my comfort zone my capacity for patience and endurance under pressure. And if this is true, then this presents a very helpful thought for personal evaluation. But we need to be ruthlessly honest with ourselves when we go through this personal assessment. So ask yourself, when was the last time God challenged my own human reasoning? When was the last time my faith called me to do something risky? When was the last time my obedience to God made me uncomfortable? or weak in the knees, maybe even scared because I knew that failure was imminent unless God showed up and helped me succeed. These are all great indicators that our faith lives are active and growing. And though there's resistance and discomfort and friction in these areas, those living in this tension know the exhilaration of living for God and the reward of His pleasure on their lives. And those who have experienced this know that God's reward and His relationship, His involvement in their lives far outweighs any temporary discomfort or pain that these opportunities for growth require. But even still, knowing that God has shown up and really delivered in our past opportunities to exercise faith often still doesn't alleviate the sense of discomfort or fear and uncertainty with the new opportunities He presents us with. And this should make sense. Because without the discomfort, 
without the risk and without the fear and uncertainty, it wouldn't be an exercise in faith. It wouldn't be an opportunity to exercise our trust and confidence in the God we say we believe in. But knowing that God has shown up on our behalf in the past should inspire our belief that He will do it again. Maybe you're doing great at this and you've got a great handle on your faith life and things are going really well for you. I hope so. That would be amazing. And I hope you keep it up because it inspires me to strive for the same. But then maybe you're someone that when you think about it, you realize it's been such a long time since you felt that exhilaration of really putting yourself out there, making yourself vulnerable in the name of God and putting your money where your mouth is, taking a big risk, believing that God is with you. And maybe your life hasn't changed much over many, many years. And you'd give anything for an opportunity to make your mark on this world for God's sake. Are you just saying that or do you really believe that? And maybe your faith is weak and worn and beaten down, and maybe you don't have much left. But all you need is enough faith and humility to pray, Lord, I believe, just help me with my unbelief. And if you pray this, then know that God is going to give you an opportunity to grow your faith. So when it comes, seize it. And remember that as a person of faith, you are cut from the same cloth as the heroes of the faith. I don't believe it's ever too late to take the next step and go deeper in your faith. As long as you've got breath in your lungs, you've got an opportunity to exercise true faith. And your opportunity to do so may already be upon you. Maybe God has already been calling you to exercise faith in a certain area. And maybe you've got a very strong feeling that you already know what that is. But you're uncertain and you're uncomfortable and scared. And maybe you think that that risk is more than you're willing to take. And you ask, God, is this really you asking me to do this? But you don't know for sure. And you won't know for sure until you take that step. It requires faith. God is calling you to leave the safety and the monotony of an ordinary, boring life behind and to step forward, step out into the abundant life that challenges all conventional human wisdom to be with Him to be where he is, and God is where faith lives. Can you hear him? Can you say yes to his call? Are you ready to take the next step toward the abundant life and truly live? Then step out.